in the shield where we find old rocks, rocks older than two and a half thousand million years. And you'll notice that they're in relatively coherent units. Here, quite a small one. Here, a much bigger one. In other words, they're not little patches everywhere, but they're quite large areas. And we think that these are probably what have been called proto-continents. They are the first sign of bodies of granite on the surface of the Earth, which later coalesced to form the shield areas at the nucleus of all continents. So this is the stage in the evolution of the Canadian shield about two and a half thousand million years ago and more. Between those proto-continents are areas uh, of younger rock, two and a half thousand million years and younger, and lying on the edges of the proto-continents are quite commonly um, sediments, and those sediments lie unconformably on the edges of the proto-continents. And let's have a look at such an area in the field where sediments lie on the edge of the proto-continents. This is a typical boundary found near the west coast of Hudson's Bay. The Proterozoic is represented by the well-bedded strata in the foreground, and the Archean rocks are the massive rocks against the skyline behind Rolly Riddler of the survey. I've just come walking down a little gully which represents the surface between two groups of rocks uh, representing the loss of several hundred million years of Earth history. This surface is known as an unconformity. The uh, rocks on my right are a series of uh, sandstones, water lane, clastic sedimentary rocks which have been uh, metamorphosed and folded and as you can see dip off gently to my right at 45 degrees. The rocks on my left are much, much older. They're quite massive and show quite a distinct contrast uh, with the much younger rocks on my right. Don't overlook what those sediments indicated, those Proterozoic sediments. Earlier sediment had accumulated together with lava in rapidly subsiding greenstone bolt troughs. Those sediments, those Proterozoic sediments, accumulated on the edge of a proto-continent. And for sediment to accumulate on the edge of a proto-continent, the continent must have been thick enough, rigid enough, and strong enough to support those sediments the same way as the continental shelves of the present continents support sediment. The Elliott Lake sediments were deposited in a similar position on the edge of a proto-continent. And one of the best areas which shows the change in the behavior of the continental crust is in the Great Slave Lake area between Yellowknife and the Arctic coast, as described by Dr. Hoffman of the Geological Survey. Here we have the, the thin and very gently dipping sediments which are deposited on the Archean basement, the older Precambrian basement, which is exposed out in the hills over there where these beds have been eroded away. These beds were deposited unconformably on the Archean basement, but they're very thin here, although they thicken as you go westward. And you can trace these same beds thickening westward for about 60 miles, still resting on the Archean basement, and then the Archean basement disappears as you go over what presumably is the edge of the Archean continental shelf. And these beds are all shallow water beds, deposited on the continental margin, on the shallow water shelf at the continental margin, and about 60 miles to the west of us, these go into a much deeper water facies as we go off the edge of the continental margin, out into the continental rise and the deep water sediments to the west. Those limestones are some of the first marine limestones deposited on the edge of a continent. And as you look west here, you're looking out across what was once one of the first continental shelves in the geological record. Those limestones have now been stripped away, and what one's seeing is the granite of the proto-continent 
on which the sediment was originally deposited. One of the indicators of the environment in which that limestone was deposited, which indicates it was shallow water, like the lagoons of continental shelves, are the fossils. And in particular, the stromatolites, the fossil algae, which we've already met when we were looking at fossils. This is a specimen from the Great Slave Lake area. There are some areas along the shore of the lake in which very, very beautiful specimens can be seen eroded away just now as they uh, once were, but remember that they're nearly 2,000 million years old. Those cabbage-like heads uh, are a kind of a, a fossil algal garden, once covered in 10 or 20 feet of water. Algal growths similar to those preserved in the Precambrian rock record of Great Slave Lake are found living today in Great Salt Lake in Utah. There are a number of varieties of shapes, and this is one of the most important of them. The upper dark surface is a gelatinous foam of filaments of living blue-green algae. It's only that upper surface which is living, and the algae trap particles of carbonate and build up this shape from a hard base. They always must start to grow on a firm base. And then as sediment builds up around them, they develop this kind of bulbous form. Breaking open the algal growth reveals the color of the internal um, part of the, the growth. Very white because it's only the upper surface which is living, and the main part is formed of carbonate mud trapped by the upper surface and the upper surface then grows through that uh, carbonate mud to produce a new surface. The layering isn't clearly visible in this particular growth. So both the fossils and the sediments indicate deposition in shallow water. Limestone is a typical sediment of shallow, warm water. And that's the kind of conditions that we find today on the continental shelves. So it seems that the proto-continents about 2,500 million years ago began to become rigid enough to develop continental shelves. The next phase in the story took place about 15, 16, maybe 1,700 million years ago, when the proto-continents seemed to have collided, and the proterozoic sediments became deformed. Now, of course, the results of that deformation have been eroded away, and we're left only with the roots of the deformation preserved in the shield. But it seems that it was then that the shield became a solid, rigid unit. The kind of shield that we know at the present day and the nucleus of the continent under which the Appalachians in the east and the Rocky Mountains in the west became welded due to the influence of plate tectonics. You can see that quite nicely on the panel. The action of plate tectonics has caused the shield to grow. The mountain belts lie on the margin of the shield, and there's also a mountain belt in the north, the Inuitian mountain belt, which is split up amongst the Arctic islands. So the story that we can read in the anatomy of the Canadian part of the North American continent shows us that about 3,000 million years ago, what we had were proto-continents. Proto-continents that were then thin and on which greenstone belts developed. The proto-continents became thick and rigid due to the accumulation of material underneath them, progressive differentiation. Then they developed continental shelf type rigidity. Those collided, provided us with a rigid shield around which plate tectonics welded the mountain belts that we know today.